All right, welcome to Nerdy Book Club. This month we are reviewing Concrete, the complete short stories from 1986 to 1989. Uh, obviously, if you've read it, you know what the character's like, kind of a more uh, slightly serious version of the thing, you could say. Uh, there were also single issue stories being published around the same time, but they're not really in any particular order, so you can kind of jump in any time. And that's it. I started reading this in the early 90s, probably. It was once I got kind of tired of Marvel and DC, I started buying this, among other things, mostly from Dark Horse. So, yeah, this goes back a long time for me. Um, so I guess I'll give a rating. Um, it, I give this an 8 out of 10. It didn't hold up quite as well as I thought it would. However, it definitely was better than almost everything Marvel and DC was doing at the time. So I'm glad that things like this exist. <laughs> And I wish there was more things like it. And I think it would make a great TV show. And I'm surprised it's never been adapted into one because as far as I know, Paul Chadwick has done some work in Hollywood as like a, maybe a storyboard artist or something. I'm not sure what, but I think this would make a perfect TV show. So there you go, eight out of 10. So uh, since Keith is on my viewer, I will pick Keith next. All right. Um, yeah, so I hate... I had read comics as a kid and then stopped reading them. And then uh, I tried to get back into them and Concrete. There were like three comics at my library. It was Watchmen, Concrete, and Madman. Aw. Yeah. So, Madman. Yeah. I, but I mean, like, I got through it in like a weekend. So, right. you know, uh. now they have this giant room all dedicated to comics. But at the time, um, anyway, uh, so I'm more familiar with. Uh, later stuff so these i think are a little bit didactic he gets a lot better at integrating the philosophy and you know a lot of it's like um ruminating about humanity in later issues here it's kind of explicit like what he when he's like this is one thing about this so uh but as you said this, like um this is a very transitional comic it's like you know it could be published today you know it's hard to imagine uh, you know there wasn't a lot of stuff like it in the eighties, the slice of life of a superhero, you know, it's like this, right. this supposed superhero, but like, you know, we don't really see him doing a whole lot of stuff. Um, I thought I had read this before, but it was not. So I didn't finish uh, these short stories when I was rereading them. Um, so, but you know, based on the ones that I read, I'll give it a seven. Like, I think he gets better um, later on. Uh, but it was still like, um, you know, it, it, like when you compare it to the other stuff in the same issue, it's much better. Like yeah. just the generic comic superhero, not superhero, but like just, you know, I don't know. The, it's interesting to see it alongside just, uh, you know, stereotypical trash, I guess. Right. From the 80s. Do you mean in Dark Horse Presents? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So, um, so yeah, let's have a loose. Get up there. Closer. Yeah. It's funny, Keith was kind of echoing what I told him earlier. It's a very seminal comic. Um, and yeah, I kind of feel how Mike mentioned that it didn't really age as well as I'm sure some people hoped, but I, I think I first read Concrete not that long ago, maybe 10 years ago or so. Um, so I kind of knew somewhat to expect, but I never read the short stories. Um, I'm trying to think, like, it's really hard to grade something that was so forward thinking in the eighties, but now seems kind of dated. It's like in a weird pubescent period. <laughs> right, <laughs> I look right. back on it. Uh, I'll just say 7.5. Cause it's, yeah, I'll just give it that as a rating. Um, I don't know, Patrick can go next. Um, I'll give it a seven i enjoyed the art particularly some of the surreal set pieces um i guess it's kind of hard to get a handle on what the character is about and what sort of the overall theme of the work is 
be, because I mean, these are meant to be sort of vignette, like B sides of the main story. And so, I mean, which is fine because that's what it is. Um, so uh, a seven, which is my standard rating for did not feel like a waste of time. No. Oliver. I do not have a store uh, score because I did not read it. I uh, just got cut up in other stuff, but I'm trying to uh, to read some of it as the conversation is uh, going on. So hopefully I'll uh, have more thoughts later. But Oliver, I rate your honesty at a 10. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, Alexander. Uh, I'll give it a seven. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Uh, some of the stories were hit and miss, but the art was the, the best part of it for me. I, I was going to read more, know more about him. Maybe it'd be better. Uh, but a seven. Uh, Sean, how about you? Sean um, there? So, yeah. Oh, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I would also give it a seven. I really enjoyed. Uh, it as sort of like a palate cleanser, very low stakes, no like world ending drama or stress. It's just very mellow. Mm -hmm. um, I thought some of the facial expressions were really well drawn. So I really liked the art also. I enjoyed it. I'm not sure if it ever goes to like world ending, save the world type of superhero stuff. I assume not. Like in the later stuff. Yeah, I liked it for what it was. Uh, who wants to go next? I think that's all. Yeah. That's... <laughs> all right, that's everybody. So I do have a list of questions, but now that I've just finished the book, um, one of the I actually want to talk about something else first, um, and that's that, like Promethea, this has a lot of a few stories that aren't really stories. For example. The second last one when they're kind of driving down the street and Maureen is, or no, sorry, uh, Concrete is sort of uh, like just spouting facts about the environment and all this other stuff. And I agree with everything he's saying, but then we all, at the same time, we have Maureen kind of having this daydream about what it would be, what it would be like to kind of um, uh, be able to like experience nature as this, you know, like a giant ghost or a giant football field sized, whatever. Um, much like Promethea, does anyone have any issue with those types of stories? Do you think they are stories? Are they something that there's a place for or are they kind of just more like a lesson and not really, do they really have a place in a book like this? I mean, no, this is fine because Promethea was sort of, <laughs> that's a textbook disguised as a comic book. So uh -huh. I feel like this is not, get into the excessive territory of Alan Moore getting into a podium and talking at me for five hours. <laughs> which is what I felt Promethea was at parts. I mean, like, this also gets very, like, uh, is, you know... You think it gets too heavy-handed? I don't think it gets heavy-handed, but it is just, like... Um, it's didactic, know, like, but it's, like, in little short snippets, not, like, yeah, oh, it, my God, it, it's not a TED Talk, so... It, very much like a diary comic in a way and there's room for them to be kind of introspective yeah. and room for them to talk about like oh I played pranks on kids at the beach today and like yeah it's it's very very much I, I was telling Keith like do you think this is like the like the beginnings of like the white boy diary comics like i kind of think it is in a way because there's a lot of like pining after um, oh wait uh, i'm sorry the what diary comic <laughs> the the white boy lonely sad diary what? comic is this a genre tell me more jeffrey brown i, read. I would say it's a genre i've read enough of di like straight white boy sad diary comics is definitely in my opinion, it's a subgenre of comics. You can hmm. fight me. <laughs> no, no, no. You know what? That's interesting because, like, um, that's what it's funny because I love the comics journal, but a lot of comics they recommend, like, for example, stuff by Seth. Like, we did Seth at the Detroit Comics Nerdy Book Club, right? Um, I think we did anyway, or Chester Brown, or guys like that. Yeah. Of course, all yeah, Canadian. But um, they. But 
like hundred percent that's what they are and and I, I always used to compare it to 90s indie film like where it's just people driving in a car philosophizing and kind of like yeah like it's like a first year university student just like they've read one book and then they're gonna point their finger at you and tell you everything wrong with the world right a little bit of a 500 days of summer kind of a little bit is like the best movie I could think to compare to that kind of genre so in a way I feel like this was like the beginning of that genre like right it was so I don't know I could be wrong I'm open to other opinions but Keith was like I think that's too far (laughs) <laughs> so it, it, but it's like not it's not confessional there's a story there's a plot i don't feel like it's just people talking at me like things yeah, happen like, there's characters they do things a diary yeah. thing in a way yeah. it's very slice of life diary like and, the, and like a lot of the things that happen are very mundane yeah you know it's and, like and, yeah that's what's amazing about it is it's this very much like so much fantastical things but they managed to tone it way down and that's um that's a feat like that is a goddamn feat to make this crazy concrete man seem like so kind of like oh, oh i just wish the scientists would like me yeah like that's well, that I, is I, so sad for that i guess it's <laughs> something to recommend it for me and also something a bit odd because i mean having read the introduction the the whole premise is that he wanted to make this character who's very down to earth. Like it's supposed to be normal, normal quote unquote things happening, except he's in a concrete body. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it, it was kind of interesting because like these types of characters, usually when you encounter them, they have so much angst, like, Oh, like, Oh no, I'm, I'm in a concrete body now. Yeah. And I, I can't, be with Maureen because I'm concrete and I'll probably crush her, whatever. Um, but there's none of that, which is both interesting, but also like, well, what is the point of you being in this concrete body? Like, what is yeah. Paul Chadwick trying to say? Like, what? I mean, did, does he have to be in a concrete body? Like, what work is, is the concreteness of it doing? Maybe. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn it up to 11. Maybe oh. this. Now we're gonna have uh, white white girl diaries. Go for it, Lucy. <laughs> Maybe this is a like him being in this concrete body. Maybe it's kind of like um, body dysmorphia. Because like when he turns into a guy, he's just a regular looking Joe Schmo. But like that's kind of interesting. Like he would prefer to be like just kind of a schlubby guy rather than this weird concrete monster that he sees himself as. Did, but he, like I, I said, I'm turning it up to eleven. Does he see himself as a monster? I I, I don't think he's yes. ridden. Does he? Oh, he does. Like, because I remember when he was talking, like, kind of looking down at the kids on the beach. He's like, man, even when I was like a normal guy, I'd be afraid to approach them. But now I'm like this hideous monster, but oh, at least I'm famous. So maybe I'll just go talk to them anyway. And then that 14 year old blows him off. He just walks into the ocean. (laughs) But that has nothing to do, I don't think it has anything to do with him being a con. I mean, he said himself, right? Like even when I was a person, like I I wouldn't approach them because they're all pretty beach bodies. It's like, I don't know. It reminded me of like that John Mulaney joke where it's like middle schoolers are mean to you. (laughs) That man has feminine hips. (laughs) They can just zero in on your insecurities. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, it's like, it it is weird where it's like, you know, like the first story where it's like, oh, well, you know, as, he's, as Patrick was saying, it was like, what difference does it really make that he's in a concrete body? Like, yeah, he can throw, the, I think the only time it comes up is he throws a car on top of a building or right. like leaves it there. But, but like, otherwise, it's just like this weird story. Like, I remember reading it being like, that was a weird story. Like, I don't even know why it was a story at all. <laughs> right, but it was right, also right. like a commentary on like fame. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it a very. Just, it's a very, I think, like San, Seinfeld. Is that a term I can use? Seinfeldian. I think it is. Where it's like, I can see that. I'm, us- I'm using things happen in the span of 30 minutes, but ultimately, like, there's not really like an overarching whatever to it, yeah. which is fine and all good. But it, it's yeah. like, 
Well, why well, do you have to be in a concrete body, though? Other than maybe allowing Paul Chadwick the excuse to depict like surreal, interesting things, which, I mean, honestly, why do you need an excuse to do that? Just do it. Well, yeah, the thing is, no. is like, but no, it's, go it's on. well, I was going to say it's interesting because he's able to use this um, uh, fantastic character to reveal things that are really mundane and down to earth. Like the way that the kids treat him, right? Is interesting mm -hmm. because instead of, I don't know, it's almost like I didn't know where it was going because I forgot, but the fact that he goes back, I, I'm trying to think of what happens. He goes back and finds the kids, right? And they're like, oh yeah, we thought it was funny. You thought we were scared. And I just like the fact that he kind of forgives them and the kids kind of forgive him. It's just not something a typical writer would do, I don't think. And I, I just think that it's interesting that he's using this character to bring that, to reveal that uh, about human nature. I thought it was really interesting, you know, things like that. Yeah, there is a lot more heart to concrete than right. there are to comics even nowadays. And I think that's part of what a lot of other comics are kind of missing. Like there'll be too much navel gazing and not enough empathy. Mm -hmm. So that was like a really, that's what makes me kind of come back and hold comic and or hold concrete in higher regard to other comics and that it does really have that heart and it's not like, it's too self-indulgent. Yeah, good point. I agree. And then it's like, you compare it to, you know, it was like, um, you know, you, you were talking about him being so angsty and like both the, and then it's like oh well he's also why is he even this if he's not going to be worrying about it and it's like i'm thinking of like all the chris claremont x-men where it's like rogue is a, afraid of yeah. uh or no that might be later um uh but yeah where it's like um you know but yeah where, where they're like oh my powers and they're just like so focused on it and it's like so melodramatic and this is like mm -hmm. well i'm a concrete man now <laughs> so uh, and then, you know, and then uh, he, he's just like, first I'm going to focus on, you know, getting this scientist's attention so that she sees me as more than just like some project. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I'll worry about like, you know, my powers down the road, one step at a time. So, you know, he's not like, um, like overwhelmed by this where it's just like you know i like i guess uh he he is there's some angstiness but it's not like angsty to the point where it's like why even bother talking to these people because i'm just uh you know the thing you know nobody's gonna well, like I mean, me I, I don't think he's i mean he's he's remarkably well adjusted for somebody who's just <laughs> brain was put in a concrete body yeah and he's, he's yeah. functioning I would say fairly normally for as, as a person just being in the world. Yeah, that that's kind of like I was like, why are these stories? You know, like some of these stories are you know so trivial. Um, but I mean, but these I, are like the B sides. Is the main series like pretty much follow this approach? Like, was there like an over like there was never an overall arc? Like the main series was just longer issues. It was just. Yeah, it was stories, very yeah. life, but like that was kind of groundbreaking at the time to have like, like a it's like a weird fantastical slice of life, right? Like, I which mean, I think is interesting in and of itself. Yeah. Like, just to like kind of put a spin on it, just like there is that kind of like him coming into his powers, but it's like slow and more realistic instead of just like ah oh, i'm radiation man i'm gonna yeah. fuck shit up like right, right. it's more like well what can i do to help humanity i don't know am i making things worse yeah there's <laughs> like a lot of the stuff i know in the first issue where he's talked about like all the things that he had done to like help people but mm -hmm. it's all mentioned it's all things that happened off screen and then mm -hmm. so like in the in the like the issues that i read like he would do things where he would like try and like 
I remember there was a strong environmental bent. Yeah. There, there was a lot yeah. of philosophy too. Um, and then he would do things where like he was trying to help out um, and do some things, but like, you know, I think that um, a lot of it was nonviolent stuff. I think mm -hmm. one of the, the letters in the first one, um, mentioned that. yeah, where they mentioned like, you could just sit there and be a nonviolent person. And I think that ends up being like a strategy that he does in later issues where he's basically just someone <laughs> that like nobody else can overpower. And so not that he beats up anyone, but just the fact that like they can't win against him is enough to like calm down the situation and then they discuss it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's well, what I recall. It's been, I think, been 20 some years since I've read it. I just remember it. like all of the lovelornness of it. That's what I remember the most. <laughs> uh, just yeah, him yeah, pining after the scientist lady. Yeah. I remember the philosophizing where he's talking about like morality and things like that. And he'll mm -hmm. debate that a lot. Yeah. You know, one of my one of my one of the most interesting stories for me is the one where he ends up fighting that bear. Because <laughs> because it's the only one it's the only time in the story he encounters or one of the only times he encounters something as powerful as him. The bear mm -hmm. does cut him, makes him bleed. But the interesting thing is is that he's so freaked out by being blinded by the blood, he ends up stepping on the girl's leg and breaking it. And yeah. so it's just it's really interesting because again, you know, we've already, we've read Miracle Man and we've read a lot of Mark Miller stuff and Mark Miller and Will, uh, what's his name? The guy that's canceled now, Warren Ellis. They go in this kind <laughs> of crazy other direction. And this is just like, what if, what if a superhero was real, but everything else was completely normal. Whereas those comics, they still have science fiction elements in them. And this is just oh, yeah. really crazy. Why, yeah. why why do we keep calling him a superhero? He's not a well, superhero. Well, he's not a superhero. Yeah, but you know what I mean? That's what I mean they, is that he is he has the powers of a superhero, but he lives in the real world. There's no there's no anti-concrete, right? There's no Dr. Evil. There's no oh. anti-concrete like evil version. There's no they could have introduced evil versions of him by the same cuz you find out later that he was given this body by an alien race. Well, right, they, but but that was never I mean because that that wasn't Paul's Chadwick's intent. Like, so I guess I, I don't like is was that his mission to sort of set out and say like it's a different kind of super like that wasn't his goal, right? Like this was never meant to be a superhero story. No, no. Okay, we've been erase the word superhero. I'm just pointing out that he does have superpowers. Sure, he's in a concrete body. Yeah, exactly. And unlike Miracle Man, or unlike the work of later writers he keeps paul chadwick keeps him in the real world there's never any um other fantastical elements introduced other than the alien race which you only see once mm -hmm. so i think that's the key to this what makes it so interesting was that like a stealth thing was was paul chadwick i feel like was it sort of like a well this got to have some shelf room on the store so we got to make it look like something that the cape and spandex types would buy oh i know we'll put him in a concrete body I did I get that. that. <laughs> I mean, it's genius. I mean, it got y'all to pick it up. Well, no, I think yeah. it was more like he was working at Marvel. He was the artist for Dazzler. And so he <laughs> can't, he, it's not like he's Harvey P. Carr or Robert Crumb. He's not coming out of the underground. He was a professional working at Marvel. And so he probably just had this idea like, well, what if I did this? And what if it was like this? And I believe at one time, I don't know, because I didn't read the intro, but I know that at one time he was either going to publish it through Marvel or through Epic Comics. And after getting all this advice from Archie Goodwin, he was like, you know what? I think it'd be better if I just did it myself because I don't want to have to kind of filter it through the Marvel way of doing comics. And so that's why he did it on his own with Dark Horse. Yeah, I think that was the best result too. Right, right. Um, with the, the launch of Dark Horse, right? Like, yeah. this is right. Like, him, these it's two so other so amazing, though, to think like this is that old. Like, I still can't get over that. It does not feel that old at right. all. Right. Those other comics did. No, they definitely did. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Like they were Excuse me, that. barbed wire feels very contemporary. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> well, except for barbed wire. Thank Everything you. Everything felt so dated. I mean, it that just... was sarcasm, by the way. I mean, that, not <laughs> Barbed wire wasn't that Sorry. long ago where it had that Pamela Anderson show mm. and whatever it was. TNT? I forget. It was a movie. No, I had a show too. I thought I had a short running show. The Boomerella? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was the, the Pamela Boomerella. That was the other Pamela Anderson the show. The Boomerella. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, it was just like, like, you know, there was DC, there was Marvel, and then this is what well, launches Dark Horse. Well, it's, it's funny because, just... like, Slice of Life comics are such a thing in manga. And if you, like, think of what were Slice of Life comics in the mid-80s in the U.S., it's like, geez, you got, like, concrete and what else? Well, you had the, you know, <laughs> Harvey Picar garbage. <laughs> I love Harvey Picar. Love Harvey Picar. <laughs> It's just funny, though, to think, like, there's so many Slice of Life mangas, but, like, how many Slice of Life U.S. comics were there at the time? Like, no, not zero. a lot. Right. So, it, that's why I'm, like, ah, I can't be too down on it, because it was so, like, groundbreaking, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I mean, it is interesting to have, like, a hook of, like, oh, he's a concrete man. Like, it's, like, oh, it's, like, we're just focusing on, um, Ben Grimm. And it's like, okay, that's interesting. Cause I would always feel bad for Ben Grimm. Like was was that the inspiration? I assume. I, yeah. Like, I mean, okay. that was the before. And he was always like sad and upset about his weird body in the comics. Hmm. So I assumed it would kind of spun out of that. I can't imagine it had no connection whatsoever. Just the designs seem very, very similar. similar. Does Ben that Grimm too. have genitals? Okay, we're nope. not. We're not. Do, nope. Nope. We're I not so. doing. Nope. Well, no. Nope. I don't. All right. We have to ben play Grimm. the mall rap. Yes. Ben Grimm is not exactly fun. what I was thinking. Thank you. <laughs> the thing wears pants and concrete does not. So well, I, I, think- I, I just I feel like if he was being more like commentary on on that whole thing, like he. Well, if he was, he was. It was very stealthy in these materials because I did not notice him. Like, I, I don't feel like, like that's the goal. Like, it, you know, yeah, he's doing I don't his own think thing. It was the goal. You know, whatever. I don't think it was the goal. I think he just was like, that was just kind of the jumping off point. Be like, okay, well, I like the idea mm-hmm. of this character, and I want to kind of explore the angstiness of this a little more. Right. And but he's not. I- but he's not angsty. He's a little bit angsty. I don't think he's, he's, he's not angsty. No, I don't think he is. I think he's a little well, bit this, angsty. This is also not, I mean, there's also a lot more stories than just this, right? And I, oh, yeah. I've read, I read them all and I believe, so Lucy, you've read them all then? I read most of them. I did not read all of them, unfortunately. But I definitely remember him being angsty the most. And like, yes, there were times where he was very environmentally and philosophizing right. so that's what, like so he wasn't all navel gazy but he could be a little angsty well how was he, how did that manifest this angst just like it came out in spurts so and like i said thankfully he had enough empathy as a character where it wasn't overwhelming but there was still this like ah oh, gee whiz this girl doesn't like me and like oh I really like this girl and oh I wish the professor would notice me. But so I, mean, was, I, like, I, I feel like that's I, a sort of a typical guy. like like you mentioned white guy diaries. I mean yeah. I, I guess like you don't gotta be in a stone body to to have those things. Like that that's yeah. like just, that's just I mean, typical that's typical guy crap. I mean maybe that's the problem where like being a little angsty isn't the worst thing ever, but like I don't know like, what would be a better what how would you describe it then? Maybe that's why. Well, I, I mean, if if Ben Grimm is the contrast category, I mean, like on and on, like oh my god, I'm a rock, like I'm a rock per, like I'm a rock person. It's well, yeah, isn't terrible. isn't this just more subtle? Like for example, when he, when Maureen and what's the guy's name? Um, what's the guy's name? I don't remember. Larry. Um, Larry. Larry. When Maureen and Larry have to get a hotel together, he's obviously jealous, but 
but he's mm -hmm. very it's very subtle he just kind of like makes a couple comments and then does and he kind of drops it so if it was the thing in, in fantastic four there'd be thought balloons and he'd be like you know like shouting at the <laughs> sky and all that for like three pages but it's just it's there it's just much more subtle right so mm -hmm. i think that's an example right there but why don't we talk about the art for a minute because uh paul chadwick actually said that he feels like people respond to his writing more than his art but i was actually really impressed by the art this time around yeah i don't think he's like a, a very flashy artist but my favorite thing about his art is the way he depicts underwater and the way he depicts all of the daydreaming that concrete does does anyone else have any comments about that i i love the facial expressions i know sean mentioned it but like the part where um larry's like you're naked all the time and he's like why are you noticing or something like that like right. just that two those two panels next to each other i just love that it was so good and it was really subtle and just is perfect. I think I really appreciate the subtlety of his art. Like he knew how to have just enough line work, like where it wasn't overpowering and it was just, it was very, it was good. It was refreshing. Like it was like, nothing seemed overworked. Mm -hmm. um, some of it, like the part where the shark was circling the divers, like that irked me a little bit because it was very tell don't show. Mm. Like that should have been a couple more panels of the shark circling the divers, I think, instead or the surfboarders. I think instead of him like point by point explaining like, oh, here are the sharks. Oh, they are coming to get these guys because they're splashing like seals. Oh, it's because I took their board. Like you could have showed all that instead of just. Yeah, that was you're right. That that was like one of the only times in the book it felt like a Marvel comic of the 80s like, <laughs> over explaining things, right? Yeah, it, I wouldn't go as far as to say it felt like a Marvel comic from the 80s because it wasn't that glaring. Yeah. But that was like one point where it's like, oh, you could have so easily right. dropped these cool little sharks like gathering around these guys. And mm -hmm. it would have been really, I could just see the pages in my head and it would have been really more impactful than him just point by point explaining. Um, but yeah, again, it was still, even with that kind of hiccup, it's still miles above the stuff at the time. Yeah. It felt like um, a rookie mistake, I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, the other thing I really liked that he did was he used the page, uh, uh, like he designed the page as a page, like, um, I don't know if you guys can see this, hold on, like, hold on, can you see that? It's hard to see, ah, forget it, it's not going to work, oh wait, huh. I'll put it right here, will it work? No, okay, forget it, but anyway, uh, like he'll have like a, on page 19 of the original book, like a montage where he'll have like a border of like he's at a party so there's a border of balloons yeah. and like getting like you know ice cream in the face and then something else and then in the on the page he's jumping and it's like one scene then there's another scene and then inside his face there's another scene so this is an example where with the way the comics are reproduced digitally now right they try to make it panel by panel that you kind of just flip through but something like this could only be read as a, a as a complete page right so I think it's pretty interesting use of the medium. And that was a very strong spread too. What's that? That was really strong spread too. Yeah, yeah. And a, I, I kind of forgot about that, like how much of that there was in the book where, you know, like panel, um, the shape of the panels would not be the standard grid. It would be like all kind of warping around and rounded. And there's some pages where he has a whole bunch of little panels in a row showing something. And um, I think the first time I read this, I did not appreciate all that stuff, but I really do now, you know? I, I guess feel like that says, that speaks to how strong he was at doing layouts where he could do these experimental layouts and they didn't stand out as being um, jarring. Like they fit the story. Like it was, he was really good at doing that, like planning out pages. Yeah. Where, yeah. Yeah, you're right. And it wasn't self-indulgent. It was actually telling the story or adding to it or, or whatever, expanding like, on an really idea. Well. So yeah, he was really, really good at that. Like I said, he's just good at being subtle. Like it's mm -hmm. such like, 
it's funny that it's something that like that subtlety you'll forget about it but at the same time it's like if you really pay attention that's a very very strong skill that few people have like they just overwork shit or you just that sticks out in your head Mm -hmm. yep so does anyone know harlan ellison the writer yeah yeah yeah, he loves this book. So if he loves a comic, then I know it's good because he wrote <laughs> my favorite episode of Star Trek and he loves this. So I know it must be good. But anyway, um, so I had a bunch of questions. I don't know. Let me go. Let me go to them right now. Wait, um, that's what you know Harlan Ellison from? Star Trek. <laughs> did he do anything else? Yeah. No, I'm joking. I know he did. Okay, but yeah. That's where I was first exposed to him. Even does I think he doesn't I think he disowned that episode too. Aww. Yeah, because it was rewritten. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. here's my first question: How would you describe the main and supporting characters in Concrete? How do you come to understand these characters' personality traits? Hmm. I mean, we already discussed, like for example, him putting the car on top of the garage. That was a cool little twist because, again, it reveals his character. Like his, It's like in that story, he was tricked by the mother and he could have just taken off, but he decided to stay anyway to make the kids happy. But in the end, he kind of got her back, right, for basically conning him. So I thought that was a really cool little twist. And then I also like the one we talked about earlier where he plays the trick on the kids, but then he feels guilty. So he calls them up. So again being subtle right like revealing the character's um personality through their actions i think that's something paul chadwick does really well does anyone else have any other examples there's a lot of whimsy to it too which i forgot about like it's very fun very daydreamy whimsical which i think helps a lot yeah Yeah, go ahead Oh, just the, the sense of humor to it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it goes back to what we were saying about like some of these are not really stories, but there's something to be said for just showing a daydream, like Maureen's fantasy about what it would be like to interact with nature. There's really no way to tell that in a story, but it's cool to see it visually depicted, right? Very cool. Mm-hmm. Very creative uh, use of the, the medium there. I mean, one of the stories is him finding a bag of candy. <laughs> so. see, that, see, but that's interesting because because you're reading it, you're thinking, oh, here we go. It's going to be a dead body. But it, it it's like it raises your expectations to be something melodramatic and it ends up being mundane again, just a bag of candy, right? Yeah. So, and even the guy uh, in the second last story or the last story, the guy who's... um trying to get into all the hotel rooms you think oh maybe this is a thief and he's gonna like have to punch someone out but no it's just some drunk guy trying to get into his hotel you know (laughs) so it's that's kind of cool um anyone else okay here's another we talked about a lot of them but (laughs) gave a lot of examples already yeah Um, okay well here's one (laughs) <laughs> here's one so the, the the thing that i always found uh re- cool about this is that paul chadwick does talk a lot about nature and in, in the environment and stuff like that but the character's name is concrete and he has a body like concrete so the question is to what extent is the physical appearance and the body language of concrete relevant to his personality mm-hmm. so I, I guess the question is is his is his body is it like does it serve as like a metaphor for his personality Like, I'm thinking because Paul Chadwick created this character, it's probably a subconscious thing where he's projecting maybe his own insecurities about himself onto this character. Like, this character is a manifestation of maybe the way he feels sometimes. I'm only assuming that. But did anyone else get that kind of vibe? If it is, it's a very self-aware... Like, I mean, like, you know, we talked about like how he, he, his level of angst only, like he's only worried about like one problem at a time. I feel like, what? like, you know, he wants to date Maureen without, 
uh, and he's worried about that without thinking about the next step of what would dating her actually be like. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, if it, you know, I feel like if it is, it's like uh, it may or may not be. I don't know enough about Paul Chadwick to say, but if it is, it's a very like self-aware version of himself where he's like, you know, he, he, yeah, I mean, like I could imagine a story like that where you just get hung up on one thing. And then you make like a, you know, 10 page story about it. It's like, how would I even get so-and-so to, to, to know that, you know, they're so wrapped up in the work. And so he makes a 10 page story about it, but it's like, it's a very self-aware level to realize, like to, to distill it to such like, you know, all that, that story is just a, you know, one of the stories is just like, I just want her to notice me as a person versus this and you know i'm not saying that that it's not a author insert but that the 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 storytelling or or you know his knowledge of himself is is rather impressive that he can like focus so tightly on such a narrow topic and make a story out of it mm-hmm. Well, I also want to point out for the record, Concrete does not have any genitals. That's confirmed. Like, I'm not just talking about <laughs> what we see, but apparently in another story, they confirm it. So, again, that could be maybe... Does Paul Chadwick feel like a eunuch? Does exactly. Paul Chadwick have genitals? <laughs> yes. Right. Why, you, but... I think that's the broader question. Is his dick broke? <laughs> oh, but, but, like, I don't, like, it... Well, I, so we keep calling it angst, and I think we're abusing that word. Like, yeah, that's what I asked you earlier. Not, what uh, is he's it? not angst. Like, I mean, when you I mean think, he's not. I mean, he's having like normal people feelings and normal people reactions to stuff. Like, this is not. An so then, what word should we use person. then? Just no, like normal. He's doing normal things. He's going through his life. He's experiencing emotions and longings and okay. feelings. He's a it's normal like, emotive boy. Yes. Okay. And and speaking of his uh, depiction of his body, I mean, like, it's very, like, not fluid's not the right word, but it's fairly flexible and, like, yeah. I mean, for, the, a concrete I mean, man. for a concrete man, like, not yeah. stiff, very organic and, like, fluid, which I just, you know, when I think angst, I think like Al Simmons. Now, that's an angsty guy. Like, <laughs> that is um, angst right there. This is not that, which leads me more to buy to my theory of Paul Chadwick wanted to do a slice of life comic. Good on him. There is nothing like it in the stands, but Hey, mm-hmm. we got to sell books. So we're going to put him in a concrete body. Yeah. Why not? I'm going to take Ben Grimm and make it all about him. Because unfortunately, well, good ideas are good. I mean, you want to sell stuff. You got to cater to yeah. uh, the LCDs. at yeah, first. It's still interesting. And in it's okay. Yes. I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with this. Like, I mean, I guess I just don't want to like Leonard with too much metaphor and meaning because I don't think that it's a slice of life story. There's this dude, he's a yeah. concrete body, he's going through life and he's things yeah. for us to read. <laughs> yes. It's like trying to invest Seinfeld with any more meaning beyond the fact that it makes you laugh. Like, that's it. That's it. Well, no, I think Seinfeld is much more than that, but oh. that's another discussion. <laughs> But anyway, uh, okay, how would this comic seem different if you only read the text and or only looked at the images? And I think this is a good question because there are some people that who are not uh, comic book fluent who tend to ignore the images. And I think in this comic book, that would be virtually impossible, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, to continue this question, how are these, how do these elements work together or or not in constructing the characters. We've kind of talked about that a lot, but I think we can agree that this comic, <laughs> if you just read the text, it would be, I mean, that, you know, the art is like 75% of the information you're getting. Even mm-hmm. if there is a lot of text, right? I mean, the art in this is more than half the enjoyment, I feel. I think too, though, it depends issue by issue. Like some issues are more, uh, visual heavy and some are more text heavy so mm. it, it depends like some of the comics they work together very well 
and some of them it's one is a little bit better at telling the story than the other and then some of them you flip up so it's I, I almost feel like this is his way of to kind of play around and experiment with things in a like a lot of different ways like him not only just doing slice of life but like exploring like his own philosophy on things and like oh well maybe I'll just have a bunch of sight gags in this one and like I just feel like this is kind of his way to play around. Right. Yeah, I mean, he could tell almost any story with this character, right? Yeah. He could take any far. regular situation and just throw concrete into it and see what happens, kind of thing. Yeah. It's just like a fun little art experiment. Mm hmm. Also, I didn't realize how many that like I kind of forgot how many concrete stories there are because according to Wikipedia, there's like seven volumes. And I, I think yeah. I, have, I think I have almost all the stories in the original form, except for these short stories, which is why I have this book. But anyway, just a little comment there, a little side note. Had them. I don't know where they are now. I but yeah, there are quite a few of them. That's why I said I didn't get through all of them because there's a lot. It's more than you think. Right. So, okay, you know what? My next question is almost the exact same, so I'm going to skip it because it talks about how, how do the images and languages work together to communicate the plot. We've already talked about that. <laughs> so my last discussion question is, how, if at all, do the characters in the novel change throughout the text? What does Paul Chadwick do to indicate these changes? Do you find these changes realistic? Why or why not? I personally don't know if there's much change in these because they're all such short stories. I guess a better question is, are there any surprise revelations about their personalities? Like, um, do, uh, you know, do any characters appear to be one thing and then end up being another? Like, there's really only three main characters, but we kind of don't really get enough in this, I don't think, to see like a change. Does anyone else feel any differently? I mean, like a lot of this, we kind of don't get too great of an impression of the character. You know, it's like we get like these little moments of them. Right. Uh, oh, never mind. What do you want? Um, uh -huh. I think because they're trying to make the characters realistic that they kind of very slowly organically change. So I appreciate that about there's no like, like I was talking about earlier with someone else like how most of the time in real life there's no big revelation and all of a sudden you're a different person like usually right. things happen so slowly you barely notice it so I think he slowly does learn lessons like all the characters do but again they're not like oh this is big shocking change and now I'm a completely different person it's like no they're like slowly changing learning new things continuously right I think a lot of it hmm. oh, probably just tracks Paul Chadwick in real life because <laughs> he gets more and more involved in like, you know, environmental issues or whatever philosopher he's reading at the time. Right. So. I mean, I, I don't really think they go through any kind of arc in these sets of stories. Like they, mm -hmm. they, they start off, I think pretty much where they started off. Although I will say that Larry seems the least developed. At, at least he's the one I got to know the least from mm -hmm. those three with these sets of stories. Right. Well, I can That's say for the record that in other stories, those characters do develop, and I won't spoil what happens, but there's a few interesting developments. I'll just leave it at that. But what are we going to say? Um, Lucy? Oh, I don't like, I was just going to say that's fair to Patrick's okay. point. That's all I said. Like, that's fair. Cause mm -hmm. like he's focused on the least in the stories we read. So I was like, that's a fair point. Well, <laughs> we know he has a lady friend and um, uh, we <laughs> hope that that truck is insured. And um, I guess he's not that heavy <laughs> that he gets carted around in it. Well, here's a question. Um, We've debated before about uh, the, I, I think in our uh, discussions, we've talked about superhero origins. Like I've actually mm -hmm. said that superhero origins are the most interesting part of this character. And other people think it's the most boring part. 
And yes, I know he's not a superhero, but he does have an origin. If they do eventually give it away, would it be better to never find out where he got his concrete body? Because in the story, you actually see, I think it's like a, like a basically a UFO kidnaps him. And I'm not sure what happens, but he ends up kind of like with his brain put in this body. And I don't remember what else happens, but would it have been better to just never explain that? Or do you think it's something that needs to be explained? I mean, I guess I'm agnostic. I, I could take it or leave it. <laughs> so, But like, it's interesting because this first story is, as far as I know, it's the first appearance of concrete and he's just reading letters. Uh, like if this, <laughs> like if this was adapted into a Netflix TV show, would people accept this as the first episode? Here's this guy and he's just reading these fan letters. Like, I got a feeling they wouldn't. I think they'd want to, unfortunately, good or ill, modern audiences, they got to have an explanation. They got to have before concrete, right? Or concrete begins and show his origin and all that stuff. So does anyone I, else feel it's something they don't, they don't need to show? I disagree. I, mean, I think it's something, I feel two ways about it. I think it's something they didn't have to show. But also I think, it would have been fun if um, it's a little bit of a trope, but like if they just showed like constantly having different origin stories, like they did for the Joker, like that right. kind of would have been too. just like a whole issue of like, what if this is how concrete came to be? No, what if it was this? What if it was this? Like that would have also been fun. Just go all in and go mm. over the top of it. So I think that was part of the point of concrete though. It's such a slice of life thing that this is supposed to be inconsequential. And I don't think, it I think they could have got away with like the first episode just being leather letters like I I keep struggling to remember I know I watched something I almost want to say it was the clerk's cartoon like something that's silly where like the first episode had like a last time and they just like flashback to like a couple minutes earlier like it was just this really silly thing or just like oh yeah let's let's read letters from our fans just like even though this is a brand new thing <laughs> just because right. that was so inside the comic medium we're like oh here's the fans to the, like the letters to the editor mm -hmm. like that's how they begin it and it's like oh well, let's begin concrete that way too like it's a very in comic booky thing you know sure. very wink wink nod nod mm -hmm. so i'm i'm both fine with it i i think it got away with it i, I people on netflix i think can handle it mm -hmm. it, it might take a minute to get used to it but i think it would be like a sleeper hit for sure well i don't know <laughs> you disagree there's it's like um i know for the sopranos they wanted it it was originally going to air on fox and then when they that was very different and then when they rewrote it for hbo he adds a scene where in the first episode where uh tony soprano kills someone and he was like i think that's why it didn't get picked up by fox because <laughs> like you know you have these expectations and like you know he wanted to do a tv show that was different and then like, but you couldn't be too different. Yeah. So I feel like if you have like a, a superhero y type comic, I mean, like, it is kind of remarkable. Like, you're reading the first issue and it's all about all the crazy things that he's done. It's like, oh man, I saw you, you beat up, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that car or whatever. Like, you know, you, you're so strong. Like, yeah, you, you were able to do whatever. And, like, it would just be, like, that is kind of a wild thing where it's like, you know, I keep talking about comparing it to X-Men. It was like, honestly, the fights in X-Men, I didn't care about the most. It was like the the other stuff. The, right, the, I agree. The, yeah. That's and so funny. And so this is just like, we're just getting rid of that. Right. We're not All bothering. drama. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're not gonna waste any time showing him fighting something. He's a big guy. He's strong. We established that. We talk about off screen some of the things he's done, and then we just get to, you know, him, you know, going I mean, to I, kids' birthday party. I I don't. I'm not a market researcher, so I don't know what the crap white blooded Americans like to watch. But um, you mean red blooded whatever um but i do but i do th red white whatever um i i, I do think what i mean I, white think so like. I don't know but i i think audience, there's there's a slice of audience that maybe 
I don't want to say sophisticated, savvy, savvy enough to uh, handle that kind of thing. Although, in, I mean, we're going to take a little si aside. So, like, we just want, all our stuff is streamed. Like, I don't even, I, I don't even remember the last time we did network TV. But um, uh, yeah, I dipped, no, we, we dipped our toes into the new Quantum Leap. And I'm like, is this the level of crap they air now? Because this is <laughs> garbage. What is that? What? Really it, it's terrible. That, like, what is this? Like What's going on? I have such fond memories of. And, like, even now when I revisit clips, I was like, that was pretty fucking no but we we oh. tried the new one because i'm like oh an asian lead well this is interesting and i'm like what is this <laughs> Who, trash what is this? What is this? i have it at elementary is good <laughs> but yeah i will give you that though yes that yes yes it is i i think birdman needs to come back in the theaters that was one of my favorite underrated superhero movies just saying mm. it's great <laughs> Although I don't know if Netflix will sink money because I mean this concrete, it's gonna be CGI. It's gonna, Comics are it's hot gonna, though. It's gonna need Thank lots you. of money. Lots of comic money. Hot. Hmm. hot comics. I bet you could do it with the foam suit. Hell yeah, just do it. I'd watch but it. That would make it too comedic, which is not the no, tone. I would that's love not, it. That's not the tone we're trying to strike though. I don't think. I could still love it. I'd still watch the shit out of it. Well, the other thing with this is if it was a TV show, I think people would expect an overarching, like, you know, like the end of the first episode, there's got to be some hook. But this show, this comic is much like an 80s TV show where every episode is totally self-contained, right? So I don't know if there'd mm -hmm. be enough to hook a modern audience. I mean, I would watch it, but I don't know if it would really work now as a TV show. I think it would be a short series at the least. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it'd make like several seasons worth, but I could see it being a short run. Well, I mean, like even it, as a comic now, if it was to come out, like as you said, it was so groundbreaking and different at the time, but like so much has come in. It could still be on Fantagraphics today. Uh -huh. I think it would fit in real well. Like if I didn't already know, I would have thought it was like a Fantagraphics thing from the early 2000s, maybe. Mm. But like, I know better. She was there reading Concrete <laughs> when it came out. No, she no, was, no, no. She I was told one you. year old. I told you. I, I, <laughs> way to age me. <laughs> no, I, I haven't. It wasn't that terribly long ago when I first started reading con Concrete. But like, yeah, just. I don't know. I just seeing the date when it came out and just hammering that in. It was like it doesn't feel like it's that old at all. Right. right. Yeah, I will agree with that. But it was just like, would it stand out the way that you know? Right now, right now. Yeah. I don't know about now. <laughs> well, no, which is a credit to it because there's a lot more diversity in the art form right it's not yeah. just keeps, it's not just keeps and tights like this kind of storytelling is very prevalent yeah it jeffrey has... brown chester whatever it would need another hook to yeah. it like yeah, kids nowadays are just not satisfied with just a concrete body i mean you need something maybe more. like post-apocalyptic concrete would be the way to spin it which he kind of touches on in this in this collection yeah just keep going yeah after the bomb the concrete stories no <laughs> no well we've only got a small group so we should probably wrap it up soon um we haven't heard much from alex or oliver have you read it yet have you finished the book uh, I just got to issue number six. He's currently <laughs> he's currently floating in space. Perfect. I, uh, I think Oliver, you'd be all about this. It seems it seems fun. Concrete. I'm I've read five issues so far, and I'm enjoying it. It seems very fun. I like. Yeah. I I enjoy that. You know, he's he's just a guy. He's, he's just, just a guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's just some guy. Uh, I, will I, say I do. Like, I, I I will say I did like the um the bit with, where there's this artist who's obsessed with him. Same. And she's like, same. she sends yep. him these these pictures, these little same. slides, and his like 
publicist or whatever opens them and is like mm-hmm. showing them to him and he's like man i wish they were nudes <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. Just a regular. But yeah, it's like another like really didactic issue where he's just like quoting um what philosophers about you know the importance of you know Oscar Wilde and all these other people about like art is this, like the gem hardened flame of whatever uh, of the artist is uh you know the purpose of this. And it's like, you know, it's again it's this, the, the story is she sees him. And that's pretty much oh, it. I mean, yeah, there is that, like, the meat of the story is very much telegraphed through and in between the lines, which is nice, though. I find that so refreshing where, like, not every fucking thing is spelled out for you because you are a child and you can't handle anything else. It's like, no, there's, like, a lot of room to, like, okay, I see what he's doing here. She really this hates pretty clever. People. Whatever, those guys are jerks. They weren't what? all hobos. Who were? Like the, the, the guys that were catcalling her. Uh, the homeless guys. Call, they weren't her. all homeless. She calls them all homeless. Yeah. Were Most they homeless? homeless? Well, there was oh. one homeless. I think there were like there's like one or two homeless guys that okay. she walked past. Also, I think most people in LA hate the homeless. Um, <laughs> so see. it's kind of kind of par for the course. There are so many homeless people. Yes, I mean, it's... like, there was, like, I remember walking down the road and it was just like three car spots were filled with tents it's by the side of the like road. like where hobos try to go because it's nice all year long. You don't have to deal with winter. Oh my gosh, San Diego. It was LA, insane. LA is a, a city with a very, a very large divide between the rich and the poor. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, it was I like I didn't know Skid Row was an actual place until right. I ended up there. You just thought it was a band that sang <laughs> "I'll Be There for You" in eighteen. I ended life. up there, yeah. but yeah, your porno career didn't take off, and you ended up on Skid Row, and now you're an attorney. <laughs> no, it was just like I got lost, or I uh, was yeah. you got lost. Um. Yeah, I was just like wandering around and then I was like, pull up my phone. I was like, it was a really bad neighborhood. And then I pull up my phone and I was like, you are in Skid Row. I was like, oh, this is real. Oh, okay. Anyway, but yeah, it's just, I don't know. It, 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 it seemed like for an artist, for someone who's supposed to be so good at like noticing the world around them, she's very single-minded yeah and I was that like, was I was the to read. Po- well that, that was, was the whole that, point <laughs> yeah i thought that was the point it's like oh what if a lady had a crush on concrete but she was just as awkward and all she could do was like maybe if i get really really good at art he'll notice me it's not even just like good at art it's like good at drawing but him it's, it, it's not a crush it's almost like this weird like session yeah it's it's an like obsession. she's a but, stalker she's a weird she's a stalker she, She's a okay, fangirl. Fine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's more. It's okay. Fine. An adult crush is actually a stalker. That is my own shortcoming. And not. <laughs> I don't know. I... <laughs> no, I feel there's a line there. Um, that you know. Yeah, you can be an adult and have a crush. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 I don't know where Rami Malek lives. Now, if I was a stalker, I <laughs> I would know that information. So, <laughs> I but but I don't. You. Can no. find this out. <laughs> Keith, you're just losing it. <laughs> Why? Why is Keith losing it? Is something wrong with Rami Malek? Keith, Keith what's wrong? No, Keith no, is more mad. There's something wrong angling. with Lucy. Yeah. Okay. I'm fine. I don't have any records. I know what I shouldn't do. <laughs> but what I would have so he's a speechwriter, so it's kind of weird to me. The speechwriter is a celebrity because he's in a concrete body. Um. And it's just of, of all the kinds of celebrity to fixate over, like mm-hmm. a speech writer. Yeah. Which is cool because speech writers should get more recognition, I feel like. Unless you're writing for awful Republican people, then you should. <laughs> yeah. Herschel Rocker's speech writer should get more uh, recognition. Oh, no. <laughs> that would be the saddest person to have a crush on. That would be so depressing. I'm sorry, to stalk and obsess over. That would be so, very depressing. 
choice. We should probably bring it back around. <laughs> Okay. So I guess the final question is, is anyone going to continue reading more volumes of concrete? Because I know I will. I'm going to probably reread the whole thing now. Um, it's good. It's, that good. Yeah. it's really good. Uh, Alex, are you going to read any more concrete? Uh, yeah, I probably will at some point in the future. <laughs> nice. Oliver, are you going to finish this volume? Uh, realistically, if I'm being honest, probably not, but, um, I did enjoy what I, what I read. Um, so maybe we'll see. Um, I've, I've, I've been enjoying it. So. Okay. Well, I guess we should do our number ratings then. Right. I mean, we all, we all know we pretty much keeping them the same, right? Has anyone yeah. changed their number? I doubt it. Right. <laughs> well, I didn't have, I didn't have a number at the beginning. Oh. I have. So read yeah. A yeah. What's your number, Oliver? Yeah. Well, so I, I read five issues and of those I would say it's like I would say it's an eight like I've I'm go. I'm enjoying it it's um like I I, I don't know, I, I really enjoyed the like slice of life like just this kind of weird guy going through life and it is it is also just very funny as well like him having this daydream about like going to the beach and impressing all the ladies and then he shows up and this woman takes a look at him and he and calls him ugly and he just like walks into the ocean it's very good it's very right. good that's a great moment yeah, glad I, you brought that up reading the first issue after these shorts is really worthwhile it's mm -hmm. it's fun it's a fun time yeah i think that the uh the comic the the things that I, the trade paperback that i read where like he spends more time it's not like these vignettes yeah um, it has it more gets, breathing room yeah it gets uh which helps i mean it gets a lot more philosophical mm -hmm. uh, i mean like you know, like i said you know there's the artist story where it's just like quotes about being an artist um pretty much but i don't know like he'll debate himself like that is one thing that is really yeah. hard to do is that um it's very, different voices yeah, yeah it's really good at showing a character that's very much in their own head which is hard to pull off yeah yeah i mean there was like um you know there's different writers uh to compare there's like a contemporary of william shakespeare john gay and you know the criticism of him is that all of his characters, you know, tell jokes in the same way. So right. they all sound like John Gay. Yeah. And then, like, you know, in these concrete stories, like when he has more time, when he can argue with himself, like they do sound like he does a really good job of not just like you know everyone is concrete. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, like even in these, like Maureen, like she's in her own head. She's focused on these things. Like, mm. you know, she's a distinct character. It's not, you know. Um, yeah, it doesn't feel like it's one overarching but, person. Again, to keep puppets. going back to X Men in the eighties, <laughs> you know, the thing that's differentiating the characters is the characters versus like their accent. You know, Banshee. <laughs> Uh, with an Irish accent versus like, you know, but they're all, you know, the good guys are good guys, the bad guys. Yeah, I mean, like, yes, I do understand that they evolve over time, but. Um, I think, to be fair, the X-Men of all comics in the 80s were pretty distinct. I think like Wolverine gonna... acted different than Nightcrawler, <laughs> than Cyclops. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. that's another discussion. But yeah, I just like, like, he does a really good job of like different voices. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, All right. I think that's about it, folks. Uh, anything else left to say? Nobody? Sean, are you there? Yep. <laughs> are you going to be reading more concrete after this? Uh, I doubt it, but I will go back and read. I kind of skipped over the floating heads part because I didn't feel like it directly involved the story of concrete. That was weird. I'm glad you brought that one up. And it was also weird that there was like two in a row. That was yeah. just a weird, ex I mean, I, I'm not saying it was bad and I appreciate the experimentation, but like what a weird concept, eh? Anyway. Um, yeah. I think I'll, I'll bump up my score to 7.5. There you go. Um, I mean, you know, it, it, I feel like it, this is just a Paul Chadwick delivery machine, which is fine. Because that, mm. that's what he set out to do, and that's what we got. Um, 
So yeah, seven point five. Will I read more? Well, I mean, maybe, but after I clear my ridiculous and at this point, quite frankly, impossible pile of <laughs> things to read. Right, right. <laughs> well, yeah. So that's pretty good. I mean, I think we're all pretty much seven or eight. So that's a pretty yeah. Uh, that's we're all in agreement. Yeah. yeah. So I guess. I guess that's it uh, for concrete then. Um, what is next month's pick? The next month we are reading in a sort of late Halloween-y type thing, House of Penance by Peter Tomasi and hey. Ian Bertram. What date is that? On the 19th of November. Uh, Carlos pick, isn't it? I, that I'm is missing correct. that. I have to work. Aw. Uh, Where? <laughs> House of Penance, uh, you said? Mm-hmm. Okay. The uh, changes I'll let you know. Write in your comments. Okay, I will. Yeah. All right. I guess that's it, folks. Happy yeah. Halloween. Thanks. Happy um, Halloween. Happy Halloween, everyone. And yeah. uh <laughs> oh, Keith's gonna do a thing. No. Oh. Wait, no, he's not. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. Never mind. Oh, I thought he was going to show us his Halloween costume. <laughs> Me too. I thought he was going to do something. I don't think Halloween costume. I thought he was going to do a thing. But I guess not. Never mind. <laughs> I don't know what he's up to. So I think for, for next, um, for the next meeting, if we, if we do want to continue meeting in person, I think I can, I think I can host the next one. Okay. Okay. Um, no crash. Okay, Michael. Oh, yeah. oh boy. Oh, uh, you're still giving those away? No, I got these. It was just like a bundle. I don't know who half of these characters are. Who is this character? Oh, that's Phant <laughs> Phantom, Phantom Lady. Phantom Lady. Yeah, that's good. Lady. Then I can't see. Is that, that green flame or fire? I can't see. That's fire. Green yeah, fire. Fire? Okay. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out. Somebody, I bought like a bundle of them. I was like, I don't know who these two characters are. I can a identify bundle, a bundle who, of what? Who are they buying? Can I? Oh. Um, it was just a. Uh, it was at a garage sale. Oh, nice. But are, are they like original art, or what are they? Yeah. Oh wow! So. And who's the artist? Um, I mean, it's just like fan, not fan art, but um. Uh, Gene Cotares. Oh, okay. Never heard of them. Yeah. They're it's still really there. fun. They're yeah, not. they yeah, look good. They look good, definitely. They're really, right. really fun. So, Phantom Lady and Flame. I can identify the other ones, but I can't identify. The, yeah, those were the two. So, I was like, oh, you'll know who these are. Or Patrick, or somebody else in this club would. So. <laughs> uh, excuse me, Keith. It's fire, not flame. <laughs> It's well, different. her original name is Green Flame, so yes, is it? Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> Green Flame. Then she changed it to Fire. Okay. Anyway, right. I know too much about those characters. Okay. 